So when we get new parts for our car, we've come to accept that you have to break them in first. You get some new race tires, you take them out, and you heat cycle them. You buy a new engine, you go through your break-in procedure. Well, unfortunately, with brakes, somewhere along the way, it became okay just to get some new pads and rotors, throw them in, and go out and hammer them on the racetrack without preparing them properly. That's a really bad idea, and there are a whole bunch of reasons why. In this episode of No Brakes, we're going to tell you why. We're going to tell you how to bend in your pads and rotors properly, get them ready for heavy use so you can get more enjoyment out of your car. All right, Houston, we've had a problem. So what is bedding in brakes? Well, there's also another word for it. It's called burnishing. So we'll use those interchangeably throughout this video. In racing, the word burnishing is a little more popular, whereas in the aftermarket, most people use the term bed in. But basically what you're trying to do is made up your pads and rotors, get them to uh, the point where they're ready for heavy use. So there's really two ways your pads typically operate whenever they're uh, applied to the brake disc. One is an abrasive manner. Uh, that's basically where the pad is rubbing on the rotor face and generating friction to slow you down. The other is called the adherent mechanism, which is the pad material is actually transferred onto the face of the rotor, and then the pad rides on that thin layer of pad material that you've put on the rotor. And that's really what we're going to talk about in this episode, is how to get that pad transfer layer onto the rotor properly, how to maintain it, and all the benefits you'll get from doing so. So the first obvious question is, if I just put in my pads and rotors, and I go out, and I drive them around, and I take them to the racetrack, or on the street, what am I missing out on? Well, you're missing out on a whole bunch of things. First of all, you're missing out on some bite uh, or higher friction level that you would have if you put down a transfer layer on the rotors. You can think of this like a drag racer. He goes out, he does his burnout, and what's he trying to do? He's trying to lay down rubber on the track so he has more grip when he launches his car. Uh, the like materials on the track, the rubber on the track and the rubber on the tires, they have a higher friction together than if he was trying to launch off of the track itself. It's the same thing here. When you lay down that transfer layer on the rotors, you're going to have more grip with your pad than you would if you were trying to grab the bare iron face. So that's the first thing. The second thing is noise. A lot of people complain about noise. You know, I'm getting this squealing whenever I apply the brakes. Well, a big part of that is if you put down a transfer layer, you're, you're going to get rid of a lot of that noise. So that's another big one. Another benefit is you're going to have an even transfer layer on there if you do it in a controlled manner. If you go out on the track and you heat your pads up and you take them over their temperature threshold and you don't do it in a controlled manner, chances are you're going to get uneven pad deposits on your rotor. So basically the pad heats up, it splotches on the rotor face, and you get high points around the rotor. And what that's going to do is every time the rotor spins around to that point where your brake pads are clutching the rotor, it's going to give you a vibration or a thumping. And you're going to feel that when you go into a turn, either through the brake pedal or through the steering wheel. It's really distracting when you're trying to go into a turn and you have that thump, thump, thump. So that's another big benefit of bedding in the pads and putting down a transfer layer in a controlled manner. On the other side, with the disc itself, you want to gradually heat that iron rotor up over time. You don't want to go out and just thrash it at a high temperature because what you're doing is putting a lot of stress on the metal. So when you do your bed in, you're going to gradually heat that rotor up over time in a very controlled manner. So it's going to really help with preventing cracking. And as we all know, cracked rotors cost money. And we don't want to do that if we can avoid it. So you're probably asking yourself, how important is bedding in my brakes or burnishing them? Well, if you talk to any professional race team, you're going to find out that not only are they burnishing or bedding in their pads and rotors sometimes, they're doing it all the time. And in most cases, they're actually paying us or someone else to do it for them because they want it done in a very controlled environment like our dyno. Um, so they're, they're looking at it as this is so important that we want it done as well as possible to give us that little extra performance edge. So it's extremely important. Along those lines, I brought in an expert on this topic to talk about the race side of things and how important this topic is to them. 
Uh, this is Steve Hood from AP Racing. He's been an engineer with them for about 30 plus years and uh, he's been around every type of racing and he really understands this topic and knows how important it is to the teams. So Steve, what are we trying to accomplish when we bed in discs on our dyno? A burnish is an extremely important part of the, uh, the brake process. Um, what we try and achieve when we burnish a disc um, is to introduce the heat on a controlled basis uh, into the disc itself. Um, one of the issues when you try and do that yourself um, at a track um, or a test day is it's not a controlled environment. You can tell the driver um, exactly what to do, but the chances are he's not going to follow every step that you tell him to go it through. So we use a, uh, an established process um, that we've developed over um, uh, a, length, a period of time where we've looked at uh, different materials, different pad compounds, um, different uh, disc, the, the weight and the usage of the disc is extremely important in uh, determining how we bed the disc itself. So how does the bedding procedure differ by team? Generally it, it will depend upon um, the disc, whether it's a, a road course, short track, intermediate, super speedway disc, um, and the pad compound. Um, there is quite a difference uh, whether you're bedding a, a 15A, an F2, uh, or a PFC01, the compound itself has uh, reacts very differently the way the compound actually works, the way it tran puts a transfer layer down onto the disc itself. So we kind of vary um, the bedding procedure depending upon the disc and the pad. If a team went out on the track before preparing their brakes properly, what would they be missing out on in terms of performance? I think you, you, you lose two things. First of all, you're going to lose track time. Uh, particularly if it's um, at a practice session uh, where you can't really afford to waste time having slow uh, build-up laps for the driver to, to get the brakes to come in. He needs to be, he needs to be able to go out on the track um, and have uh, maximum performance from lap one. Um, the other problem is that you, you can't guarantee that you're going to put the heat into it in a controlled fashion. So certainly you can, if you put too much heat in too quickly, um, even with uh, a high quality race disc, you can, you can run the risk of either cracking the disc or distorting the disc. So it's a, it, it has to be done on a controlled basis over a period of time. So Steve, are any of the bigger teams skipping this preparation step before they take their race cars out on the track? No, no, just about it. Certainly in, in, in the higher ranks of motorsport um, in this country, um, the Cook, Bush and Truck series, that they, they, nobody goes out with an unburnished disc. Everybody burnishes discs before they go out. Thanks a lot for your time, Steve. Really appreciate you sharing your insights on this topic. Sure. Thank you. Now we're going to take a look at the burnishing machine in action. I wanted to show you how this procedure works in a controlled environment, and this is the ultimate of what we're trying to accomplish when we do this procedure out on the road. Uh, we want a nice, even layer of pad material laid down all the way across the rotor face from top to bottom. And you'll see it build here. I sped this up because you don't want to sit here and watch the entire procedure, you'd fall asleep. Um, but it's a series of stops with a set pressure from certain speeds that we do. It varies depending on the type of finish you want to achieve, but I just ran a basic one just to show you uh, finished rotor from a controlled burnish versus a raw rotor. And I line them up here at the end so you can really see the nice blue-gray color versus the raw, untouched, brand new silver rotor. And again, this is what we're trying to achieve when we go out and do the procedure on the road. So an obvious question is, where am I going to do this bed-in procedure? I live in the city, you know, there's people all over the place, there's really nowhere good to do it. Well, that could be tough. Ideally, you do it on a racetrack in a controlled environment where there's no obstacles, there are no kids running into the street or animals. Uh, you have to be really careful about this, so you want to be selective about where you do your procedure. If you can't do it on a racetrack, it's okay to do it on the street, but you got to make sure you obey the local laws. You know, we, Essex, in no way encourage you to break the speed limits or do anything illegal. So you should find a road, if you're going to do it on the street, that has a high speed limit, long straightaways where you have a good field of view, and, you know, no obstacles. You don't want other, other cars out there, if at all possible. So you'll see in this video, we're using a country road, um, we went and did it at dawn. Uh, unfortunately, it washes out some of the video, uh, but the reality is we want to be safe. So uh, you want to do it at a time when there's as little traffic as possible, as few obstacles as possible. Another option would be if you live in the city, 
When I lived in LA, I used to go out in the industrial complexes and do it at night uh, when everyone was home. There's no one around, and uh, be careful. You know, the police do patrol those areas, but that was a pretty safe environment where there wasn't a lot of stuff around to interfere. So, um, and then I would go do my cool down on the highway after I was done. You know, just go hit the freeway, drive, and cool it down. So, just some suggestions on where you can do this procedure to be safe. So let's talk a little bit about the actual bed-in procedure. So it's going to vary a little bit depending on the type of pad you are using. Like I was saying before with the dyno, if we have a very uh, mild street pad, it's going to require a different procedure than if we have a very high temperature race pad. So let's talk about street pads. You get your aftermarket street pad or even your OE street pads, and how do you get that transfer layer onto the rotors? Basically, you want to gradually bring them up to temperature, typically from a speed of about 60 miles per hour, and you're going to break down to about 5 miles per hour. Now, why 5 miles per hour? You don't want to come to a complete stop. If you come to a complete stop while the pads are hot, they're going to imprint in one place on the rotor. And you can actually see, if this is done, you will see the outline of the pad on the face of the rotor. So you want to avoid coming to a complete stop. So the procedure, you go out, go up to about 60 miles per hour, and it doesn't have to be 60 exactly, you know, watch what you're doing, you aren't staring at the speedometer, you just want to get enough speed where you can generate some heat in your stop. Break down to about 5 miles per hour, and then you're going to immediately go back up to 60 miles per hour. So you don't want to let the brakes cool off, you want to keep the heat building in the system. So one after another, 60 to 5, 60 to 5, and you're going to do that anywhere from 8 to 10 times. Again, it's going to depend on the compound. So, you know, you have to be careful. A lot of manufacturers recommend one type of procedure, some recommend another. You're just going to have to find out for the specific pad you're using what the proper number of stops is going to be. So, we're going to go out on the road and do that, and I'm going to show you from inside the car how that works. Um, I took some shots from outside of the car. Honestly, they're not that exciting, so I wanted to show you real time in the car how the procedure works so you can get a good feel for how to do it on your own. Okay, now I'm going to start my series of stops as I outlined. Up to roughly 60 miles per hour and then down to about 5 or 10 and then immediately back up to 60 and just repeat. Uh, you don't want ABS intervention on your stop so you want a threshold brake. Hold your pedal just before ABS intervention. Um, you'll get the hang of that the more you do it. You know, you'll hear some tire squeal and You'll get right to that point before ABS and then just hold it there nice and steady. You'll see in this case, uh, even on the second stop, we're already seeing a little smoke. Uh, that's some of the resins burning on the pad as you heat them up. So no need to panic there, that's completely normal. Uh, that's actually one of the biggest mistakes people make. They don't get the pads hot enough to actually transfer material onto the rotor face. Um, and then you'll see here in the stops four and five, you'll start to see some sparks at the interface between the pad and the rotor. Um, obviously you won't see it if you're uh, driving the car, but you can see it in my video here. Uh, at this stage, the pads are starting to get more bite as they heat up and start to transfer onto the rotors. You'll feel that through the pedal. The pedal will feel uh, more grabby. You can feel that bite. And then as you look at the rotors, you'll see that they're starting to change color a bit. They're going from silver to more of a blue-gray color as the pad actually transfers onto the rotor. And then as you get up into stop 7, 8, 9, the smoke's going to get a little thicker um, as the pad heats up more, and you may get to the point where you start to fade the pad. At that stage, the pedal's still going to feel firm, but the car's not going to be slowing down as you would expect it to. So once you start getting some serious pad fade there, it's time to back off and you just want to go for a drive, cruise along if possible, don't stop. The, bit, the one thing you don't want to do is come to a complete stop with your foot on the brake. That is the biggest no-no here. So cool everything down, uh, drive around, get some airflow over the rotors and pads and then we'll uh, take a look and see what we have. Now we're going to take a look at the results from the first bed-in cycle. A quick note before we start though, 
Uh, the rotors and pads well, were both brand new. I just want to make sure that's clear for the start of this cycle. They were on the car, the car was washed, it sat for a day or two, that's why you see the rust down near the hat. The rotors were just from my local auto parts store and the pads were a very basic, popular aftermarket street pad. If you take a look at the rotor as new here, you can see the cross hatching on the rotor face. They're a silvery color. There's no pad material on the face of the rotor. And then you can see here after the pads go through the first bedding cycle down near the, the hat, you see a blue ring from the heat, and you also see a blue-gray color across the face of the rotor that I pointed out during the cycle. That's the pad material I was, as it was laid down. So in this case, I looked at it and thought, well, the transfer layer isn't very thick. I can still see some silver shining through there. I think I'm going to run them through another bedding cycle to make sure I get enough pad material laid down on there. So that's why we went back out. Let's do another cycle and then uh, we'll pull the rotors off the car and really get a good look at them after that. Okay, now we're going to go back out for our second series of stops. And you'll notice that even though I drove the pads around for about five minutes, to cool them down, there's still a lot of residual heat in the system, so they aren't back down at the ambient temperature. And that's why you're going to see here, even on the early stops in the series, we're getting sparks and smoke, and the pads don't take as long to get up to a temperature where they're going to transfer onto the rotor. So here in my stops number two and three, I'm already transferring material over to onto the rotors, um, whereas in the first series, it took four or five stops. And in this case, I'm able to start to fade the pads in stops six or seven, um, maybe even on five. And you can feel that through the pedal. Uh, in this case, I decided to continue on and push through because I wanted to show a few different things. One, I wanted to show how easy it is to overheat a set of street pads. Um, this would be comparable to going out on a canyon run. If you have a mild set of street pads in there, it's very easy to push them to the point where they're lighting on fire and uh, fading on you pretty badly. So you gotta make sure you have the right equipment in there. Um, also, I wanted to show that if you do this properly uh, and you lay down a nice even layer over, over a period of time, uh, you don't have to worry about trashing your rotor as much. If you do it in a controlled manner, you can get to the point where you light them on fire and smoke them up and your rotors are gonna come out okay. You don't have to worry about ruining them. Whereas if you do it in an uneven manner and accidentally, you could trash your rotors pretty badly. So a couple different things I wanted to show in this series, but you'll see here on my stop number 10, I pushed through and I lit them on fire. I could feel that through the pedal and I went into my cool down there because I could just tell that, okay, they've pretty much given up the ghost. These pads are are done, they're past their temperature, so it's time to cool them down. We went back out and did our second series of stops, and you can see here through this progression the difference in the rotor face. The first one again shows the rotor as new, and then we'll look at it after the first bed in cycle, and then we see it in the after the second bed in cycle and it's very obvious that the pad layer is much thicker on the rotor. They don't, they don't have any silver color anymore. Their blue gray darker color uh, thicker pad layer has been laid down. And what we're going to do next is show you some shots of the pads and rotors both before and after off of the car so you can get a really good look at them in a controlled lighting environment and see the differences. So this ought to help you uh, understand what you're looking at and what you're trying to achieve when you do it on your car. Again, it's even more obvious in these shots, the differences in the rotor face. I did it from a number of angles to give you an idea. You can see the grinding marks uh, during rotor manufacture versus what the rotors look like after a bed in cycle and also took some shots of the pad. You'll notice the pad, particularly on the edges, you can see they're singed a bit. The paint on the edges of the pad puck itself always burn and curl back. Usually there's a white or brownish edge and it looks like ash typically all along the edge of the pad. So uh, that doesn't mean you killed your pads or you ruined them or anything. That just means that you got them up to a high temperature and burned them, kind of scorched them a little bit. So those are what the parts will look like 
after you're done if you've done it properly. Okay, so you got a good look at me doing a bed in on some basic street pads. You know, these are standard aftermarket pads. Um, nothing too fancy. Uh, the difference is when you go to a race pad, everything changes a bit. With a race pad, it's designed to operate at a higher temperature, so it's not going to be as easy to get that transfer layer generated onto the rotor face. So what you need to do is go to a higher speed. Now, like we showed you earlier, we can control a lot of factors on the dyno. So if we wanted to get more temperature out of it, we can add more pressure or change the length of stops or all sorts of variables we can control. Out on the road, you're going to only have a limited number of things you can do. One is if you're already immediately starting your next uh, stop, there's not much you can do, do to uh, control the, the length of time between those, you know. Um, the other thing is you can't control pressure at all. Your calipers, or your brake system is going to be putting out a constant uh, pressure that it's capable of. So what do you have to do? You have to adjust your speed. Now this is where it gets a bit dicey. You definitely don't want to try to do this on the street with a race pad because you're going to have to hit higher speeds. With most race pads, you're looking at 80 plus miles per hour to get the, the energy into them to really start generating a transfer layer. Um, in some cases, 100 works well. You go up to 100 miles an hour. It may not take as many stops as 10, but from the higher speed, it's a higher energy stop. So you go out, it's the same procedure, you just need to put more energy in the system to get those pads up to a temperature where they're going to start transferring. So higher speeds. Typically on most front engine cars, like most of us drive, the front brakes are doing a lot more work. So your rear rotors are going to need uh, a little more work to get heat into them to start transferring over. So you may not see as heavy of a transfer layer on the rear rotors as you would on the front. And that's going to again differ by car type. There are some other important factors you have to think about too. One is big brake kits or ducting. If you have ducting, um, you really want to block those off before you do a bed-in cycle because what they're doing is constantly fighting you. You're going to go out, you're going to try to bed in your pads and generate heat. At the same time, your ducts are going to be drawing in cool air, bringing them into your brake system and cooling it down. So, you know, if you have ducts on the front of your car, I'd say just put some painter's tape over them, cover them up so you can get more heat build up in the system quickly. That'll make it a little easier to, for you to uh, develop a transfer layer. The other thing is, if you have a big brake kit on your car, it's going to be harder for you to do a bed in than it is if you're running the stock equipment. You know, you have bigger rotors, which are a bigger heat sink, the calipers larger, holds a bigger pad with more volume. So all of the reasons you bought that brake kit are going to make it harder to do a bed in than if you had the stock equipment on there. So keep that in mind. What may work for someone with a stock brake system on a certain vehicle isn't going to work so well if you have a big brake kit. So you may have to do more stops to get that temperature build up or from a higher speed. So just another point to keep in mind. All right, so you've done your bed-in cycle and you have this great transfer layer on there. The brakes are working fine. Everything's good. And you drive that car around on the street for a couple weeks and you look down and well, there's no transfer layer there anymore. Or you start hearing some squealing from your brakes and you say, what's that? And you go check it out and your transfer layer is gone. Well, that's going to happen. Over time, when your pads are operating in their abrasive manner, it's going to wear that transfer layer off of the rotors. So this is something you're going to have to maintain. If you want the most performance out of it, you're going to have to go do this bed-in cycle on a regular basis. It's going to depend on how often you drive the car, how you drive it, whether you're driving the brakes hot or cold. All those variables are going to come into play, but it will happen. Eventually that transfer layer will come off if you're driving this thing around cold. So that's something else to keep in mind. And you know, you see a lot of people say, hey, I did the bed in and the, and the noise went away, but you know, two weeks later, I have the noise back. What's going on? Well, that's, chances are that's probably what's happening with your system. So keep that in mind. This is something you're going to have to do on a regular basis if you want to get the peak performance out of your brake system. So hopefully you now have a better understanding of why we bed in our brakes, how to do it, and the benefits you're going to get from it. I think you're going to find that your brake system is going to give you a, a lot more performance than it had previously if you weren't doing these procedures. Um, you're going to have more bite, better pedal feel, easier to modulate, 
um, less noise, you're also going to have less cracking in your rotors, it's going to save you a lot of money, and uh, I think you're just going to enjoy the car more. So uh, be safe, have fun, and uh, hopefully this helps you out a bit.